My name is Jason Melillo. I'm the practice leader for KBKG Employee Retention Tax Credits Practice. And uh, we're here today to talk about uh, the ERTC qualifications, benefits, and refunds. Here's our standard disclaimer. Don't try this at home unless you have uh, professional uh, assistance and advice. Um, and uh, I'm joined today by my colleague, Ian Williams, who is a director here at KBKG and also uh, uh, is involved in running the practice uh, on the ERTC side. Just a little on KBKG, we were established uh, uh, a little over 20 years ago. We provide turnkey tax solutions for CPAs and businesses. We've performed thousands of projects resulting in hundreds of millions of dollars in benefits for our clients. And our team is a diverse mix of tax specialists, attorneys, and engineers from various disciplines. Uh, this combination of talent allows us to be the best at what we do and maximize the results for our clients. So um, we are a preferred provider to CPAs uh, across the country. And without further ado, let's, let's get into it. So, so uh, many of you know that the ERTC was created last year, almost a year ago, uh, with the CARES Act and uh, subsequently expanded. And, and like the PPP, the ERTC was designed to encourage businesses to keep employees on their payroll. Uh, in December, uh, December 27th, it was amended and extended uh, under sections 206 and 207 of the Taxpayer Certainty and Disaster Tax Relief Act, the TCT, TCDTRA, uh, for those of you that, that like the alphabet soup uh, approach. Um, and uh, like the Economic Aid Act, uh, the TCDTRA was part of the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2021. And uh, Section 206 was changed, uh, not, not the computational rules, but, but uh, it, it made some modifications that allowed it, uh, allowed taxpayers who are otherwise excluded from participating um, to, to go back and, and, and calculate credits. And we'll, we'll talk about that. And then Section 207 uh, extended the ERTC, uh, which was originally expiring at the end of 2020, and it extended it to June 30, 2021, and uh, also changed the computational rules. And of course, even that's now outdated because that was a whole two and a half months ago, and we've had you know even subsequent uh, acts that that extended even further. And we'll we'll talk about that. Uh, so so the tax credit is now a 70 percent. Uh, uh, amount of 10,000, up to $10,000 in wages per quarter for the periods beginning January 1, 2021 and ending December 31, 2021. Uh, there's an app opportunity to retroactively apply for the credits in 2020, even if an employer received a PPP loan from the SBA. That was a major difference back in December. Uh, prior, the CARES Act had said that if you receive PPP funds, you would not be eligible for the ERTC. Uh, the TCD TRA changed that uh, to allow uh, taxpayers that receive PPP funds to go ahead and get the credit and even get it retroactively. And we'll talk about that. Um, in addition, uh, it also made it easier for people to get the credit in advance. So we'll, we'll talk about how to do that. Uh, if if uh, a taxpayer identifies that they do qualify, they can request an advance uh, payment from the IRS. So the, uh, the Employee Retention Tax Credit Americans Rescue Plan Act, which uh, we refer to as ARPA, uh, extends a 2021 uh, act from June 30, 2021 expiration to now December 31, 2021. So it added on two more quarters. Uh, it also made a couple of other subtle changes. Um, it allowed for startups to participate in the ERTC if they met certain conditions. So somebody who starts a business after February 15th, uh, 2020 is now eligible for up to $50,000 of credits per quarter, even if other eligibility tests are not met. Um, and uh, so, you know, if, if we think about somebody who's subject to a, a shutdown order or they're, they're over uh, 100 people or 500 people, they can still uh, participate this if they meet certain criterion. So one of those criterion, gross receipts cannot exceed a million dollars. Um, and uh, they have to have a reduction in gross receipts of more than 90% compared to the same quarter. Now, if, if we're a startup, 
and we weren't in business in, in 2019, then we're going to look to our 2020 revenue. And, and you know, you'll see as we get into some of the, the ways that things are calculated, how this all works. But ultimately, uh, maybe somebody lost their job in 2020 as a result of COVID, and they, just started, they, they decided to start their own business. These people now can participate in the ERTC where before they couldn't. And oh, uh, almost just glossed over this, but the, the bottom uh, bullet point, the IRS extended the statute of limitations from three to five years for uh, payroll tax audits. So as you can imagine, um, uh, the IRS is very under-resourced right now. And uh, uh, you know, Congress realizing that this is a pretty big uh, benefit to taxpayers and there's likely to be people attempting to push the envelope or perhaps even people that are committing fraud. They wanted to give the IRS uh, an opportunity to uh, uh, ramp up and and have a, a way to uh, audit these uh, submissions uh, even after the original three year would have expired. So uh, other important dates to to just keep in mind, um, you know, that the original act was effective March 13th, 2020 through December 31, 2020. So uh, certainly if we're going back in time and we're looking at people that are going to claim the credit in 2020, uh, we're looking at payroll starting on March 13th. Um, and then of course, uh, subsequently, we've amended that uh, through the TCT TRA, uh, January 1 through June 30, and then ARPA uh, June 30, uh, or really July 1 through December 31st, 2021. So, um, and that was just signed last week. So th this is uh, really fresh, fresh news. Uh, also, in the last uh, month or so, the IRS published Notice 2021-20, which is uh, guidance on the ERTC under Section 2301 of the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act. Why is this important? Well, prior to that, um, the, uh, the only place that you could find any information was on the IRS's website under the uh, Frequently Asked Questions, and of course, that's non-authoritative. Now with this notice, 2021-20, uh, we actually have some authority that we can rely on, and that's that's really important. Um, so uh, as I mentioned, these are important dates, uh, uh, especially for taxpayers that received a first draw PPP loan. And we'll talk about the interplay of PPP and ERTC as we kind of get into this a little further. So who are qualifying employers? Well. Uh, Employers who fully or partially suspended operations during any calendar quarter in 2020 or now 2021 due to orders from an appropriate governmental authority limiting commerce, travel, or group meetings for commercial, social, religious, or other purposes due to COVID-19 or uh, for 2021, I'm sorry, for 2020 rather, employers with revenue in any quarter of 2020 that was less than 50% of the revenue when comparing to the same quarter of 2019. Uh, employers of any size, including tax exempt organizations, but not governmental entities, uh, could participate in, in, in this, but there's some limitations and we'll talk about that. Uh, for 2021, that rule changed. It's no longer a 50% reduction. It's, it's really only a 20% reduction. So if our revenue is 80% in, uh, Q1, for example, when compared to Q1 of 2021, when compared to Q1 of 2019. Now, if, if you recall, I, I mentioned that in 2020, we're comparing to 2019. Well, in 2021, we're still comparing to 2019. So that's an important uh, uh, fact to, to, uh, to consider. Um, employers that were not in existence in 2019 would substitute 2020 for 2019 above. Employers of any size, including tax exempt organizations, colleges, universities, hospitals, and medical care providers. And you'll notice that that's a little different from what we had on the 2020 slide. Um, they, uh, Congress realized that you know, they were excluding certain organizations in the 2020 uh, year, so they tried to open it up to, to more folks that, that could benefit from this valuable credit. Um, I will cover this again uh, later in my presentation, but when we talk about that 20% reduction in revenue when compared to 2019, 
there is a special rule that relates to uh, Q1 of 2021. And if you uh, had uh, revenue that was down more than 20% in Q4 of 2020 when compared to Q4 of 2019, that can actually be a qualifier for Q1 of 2021. So um, that's that's a, a little nuance uh, that that we'll we'll talk about a little bit again, just because I want to drive home that point. So uh, what are some of the types of governmental orders that that exist out there that we can rely on? Well, an order from the city's mayor stating that all non-essential businesses must close for a specified period. That that would work. A state's emergency proclamation that residents must shelter in place for a specified period, other than residents who are employed by an essential business and who may travel to and uh, from work at the workplace location. Um, an order from a local official imposing a curfew on residents that impacts the operating hours of a trader business for a specified period. And uh, as well as an order for uh, from a local health department mandating a workplace closure for cleaning and disinfecting. And, and you know, we, we saw uh, all kinds of other orders in between, you know, we've seen uh, court orders from the Superior Court shutting the courts down. We've seen uh, orders from the state uh, uh, Surgeon General or, or the lead authority for the medical profession in, in various states uh, order uh, shutdowns or limitations on elective surgeries or elective procedures uh, in order to keep hospitals and surgery centers free uh, to be able to service uh, COVID patients. So lots of different ways that these government orders can come into play. This is probably the most significant um, uh, area for the ERTC um, that that can uh, help people qualify that might not otherwise qualify because of the revenue side of it. So let's talk about some examples. Um, you know, we've got a governor of statewide that issues an order that all non-essential businesses must close from March 2020. Um, to April 30, 2020. And uh, the order provides a list of non-essential businesses, including gyms, spas, nightclubs, barbershops, all the stuff that we've seen on the news uh, probably throughout the last year, tattoo parlors, physical therapy offices, uh, fitness centers, bowling alleys, arcades, racetracks, indoor place areas, you, you get it. There's a, It's a long list. Um, employers that uh, provide essential services may remain open. The governor's order is a governmental order limiting operations of a non-essential business, entitling employers with non-essential businesses to claim the employee retention credit for qualified wages. So now, uh, uh, don't don't uh, misunderstand. This doesn't mean that the employer can qualify for the whole quarter. It just allows the employer the credit during the period of that particular shutdown. Now we saw a lot of businesses in 2020, and 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 still we're seeing impacts of this into 2021 that are are impacted by multiple orders. So in in a lot of cases it was an initial order, and then there were follow-on orders, and in some cases it's different organizations that might have started out as a governmental order and then gone to a local county order, or a city order. Okay, second example, we've got Mayor of City Y holds a press conference in which she encourages residents to practice social distancing to prevent the spread of COVID-19. The statement during the press conference is not an order limiting commerce, travel, or group meetings. Accordingly, the mayor's statement would not be a governmental order for purposes of the employer retention credit. Uh, another example, Employer C is a software development company maintains an office in a city where the mayor has ordered that only essential businesses may operate. Employer C's business is not, an, uh, not essential under the mayor's order, which requires employer C to close its office. Prior to the governmental order, all employees at the company teleworked once or twice a week and business meetings were held at various locations. Following the governmental order, the company ordered mandatory telework for all employees and limited client meetings to telephone or video conferences. Employer C's business operations are not considered to be fully or partially suspended by governmental order because its business operations may continue in a comparable manner. So it didn't really affect the way people did their business, it just affected where they did their business. So that's that's a really important distinction and I'm gonna get into some rules specific to that shortly. Um, one more example here, 
Employer D operates a physical therapy facility in a city where the mayor has ordered that only essential businesses may operate. Employer D's business is not considered essential under the mayor's order, which requires Employer D to close its workplace. Prior to the governmental order, none of Employer D's employees provided services through telework, and all appointments, administration, and other duties were carried out at Employer D's workplace. Following the governmental order, Employer D moves to an online format and is able to serve some clients remotely, but services can't access specific equipment or tools that they typically used in therapy, and not all clients can be served remotely. Employer D's business operations are considered to be partially suspended by the governmental order because Employer D's workplace, including access to physical therapy equipment, is central to its operations and the business operations cannot continue in a comparable manner. So you see the difference between the two examples, the software company where people can do business as usual by just going home, take their laptop home, connect to the internet, and you know it's no different for them. In this case though, even though they're able to do telework in some aspects, they don't have uh, access to that important equipment, which is really impactful for their, their profession and what they're providing their, their patients. So in that case, they're, they're, uh, they qualify. So uh, here's, here's kind of how, how we make those distinctions. Um, what, what is the definition of continuing operations? If an employer's workplace is closed by government order, but the employer is able to continue operations comparable to its operations prior to closure, including by requiring its employees to telework, the employer's operations are not considered to have been fully or partially suspended as a consequence of a governmental order. Well, what are the, the factors that we would consider in order to, to make this determination? Um, does the employer have support to make telework happen? Um, you know, do they have either a third party or IT team that can get everyone set up and make that work? Uh, how easy, how portable is, is the work of the employee? Are they able to, uh, you know, take a laptop home or, uh, you know, is it a, a circumstance where they work in a lab and they, they'd have to literally take lab equipment home that, that just doesn't make sense? Um, need for presence in an employee's uh, physical workspace. Uh, can the employee's uh, remote workspace be adapted to accommodate the needs of the business? You know, obviously, if we're a manufacturer, we can't bring home our manufacturing machinery uh, unless maybe it's just a, a 3D printer. Maybe maybe it's a 3D printer that that we can bring home with our laptop and and we can produce goods on that. But uh, absent that, you know, uh, manufacturing is going to bring home you know their their uh, large machinery. Uh, Transitioning to telework, how long did it take to make the changes necessary for an employee to be effective? So let's let's say, for example, that uh, we started, uh, we had a shutdown and we started making arrangements for telework, but we weren't already set up ahead of time. So we needed to uh, develop some of our infrastructure to accommodate those employees. We needed to maybe purchase some laptops, some monitors for people. Uh, or maybe they had to take equipment home, but we needed to set up security protocols. And that, that might have taken two or three weeks. Well, during that two or three week per, uh, period, we would, consider, we would be considered to be shut down because our employees weren't able to work in, in the normal course of their business until that whole process was completed. So any, any wages we paid would be eligible for the credit or any, any um, healthcare expenses that we incurred for them uh, would, would also qualify. So, uh, you, you know, a big part of, of what businesses have been able to qualify for the credit under is partial suspension of a trader business. Think about restaurants that went to outdoor dining and things like that. So an employer that maintains both essential and non-essential businesses, each of which are more than uh, nominal portions of the, of the business operations, may be considered to have a partial suspension of its operations if a governmental order restricts the operations of the non-essential portion of the business, even if the essential portion of the business is unaffected. And I've got some examples that I'll share with you in a minute. Uh, solely for the purposes of this uh, employee retention credit, a portion of the employer's business operations will be deemed to constitute more than a nominal portion of its business operations if either the gross receipts from that portion of the business operations is not less than 10% of the total gross receipts, both determined using the same calendar quarter in 2019, or the total hours of service performed by employees in that portion of the business is not less than 10% of the total number of hours performed 
by all employees in the employer's business, both determined using the number of hours of service performed by employees in the same calendar quarter of 2019. This is a really important test. Um, we'll go through some examples uh, and you'll see why, but um, you know, lots of businesses have been subject to partial shutdowns uh, and many businesses have been able to continue to operate. And so if, if they were continuing to operate, they might have thought that they didn't qualify, but because of these two factors, uh, it, it actually will allow uh, a lot of businesses to end up qualifying. So let's, let's go into a couple of examples. Um, we've got employer A that operates an auto parts manufacturing distribution business. Uh, so uh, A's supplier of raw materials is required to suspend operations due to a governmental order. So A doesn't have uh, some of the raw materials it needs to conduct its business. And uh, it, it, it can't find another supplier that, that, that can provide those raw materials. So effectively A has a partial shutdown uh, subject to maybe whether or not this is nominal or not. Uh, A's manufacturing business represents 20% of its business. And then it also has a, a distribution business that represents about 80% of its sales during the same quarter when compared to 2019. So the manufacturing operation is uh, more than nominal. It's greater than that 10%. So, so A in this case is partially shut down. Um, now, if, if that number were 5%, uh, then A would not be subject to a partial shutdown. So let's let's go to another example that I really like. Uh, this is actually a real life example. Uh, it's a retail company with brick and mortar locations as well as an online ordering business that was subject to partial shutdown uh, by governmental order on their physical locations by limiting customer capacity in each store. So so this had a dramatic effect on the business operations, especially early on in the pandemic and. And this is true of a lot of businesses, you know, a lot of shopping centers were completely shut down, especially indoor malls and places like that. So if you have places that have both an online presence and a brick and mortar presence, this can come into play. So on the basis of gross receipts, the brick and mortar part of the business represented actually less than 10% of the total gross receipts of the business. That means it would only constitute a nominal portion of its business operations, which would allow the business as a whole or, or would disallow rather, it would prevent them from qualifying for the ERTC and taking the credit. But when we looked at the total hours of the uh, brick and mortar uh, employees during that same period, during 2019, we were able to determine that 30% of the business hours were actually uh, subject to the or brick and mortar or part of the brick and mortar. And so that was more than nominal. So that actually qualified the whole company for the ERTC. So that's a huge impact. Um, uh, it had, had we only been able to look at that one criterion, um, they would have been out. And as a result, uh, all of their employees company-wide qualified for the ERTC. You know, as I mentioned, there's two ways to qualify for the credit. Uh, the first way, of course, is through uh, the uh, shutdown order. The second way to qualify is through the gross receipts calculation. So we need to know, first of all, what is gross receipts? Uh, and and the, the most important thing that I'll tell you is it's the same method that we're using for uh, tax reporting purposes. So if we're a cash basis taxpayer, we're using cash basis. If we're a accrual basis taxpayer, we're using accrual basis. And, you know, early on, we, we had people uh, saying, well, okay, I, I don't meet it on an accrual basis, but I meet it on a cash basis. I'm an accrual basis taxpayer. Can I still use cash basis? The answer is no, uh, unfortunately. Uh, so that just means you have to qualify through maybe a shutdown or, or some other way. But uh, for gross receipts, what, what goes into gross receipts? For profit entities, it's total sales, less returns and allowances plus investment income, interest, dividends, rents, royalties, annuities, less the adjusted basis in assets sold. So, so um, one, one uh, consideration here is think about a startup entity, maybe pre-revenue entity, right? Um, they've been around for a couple of years, they have employees are doing R&D, but they don't have any revenue. Well, if they, maybe they're a, a 
a private equity funded or venture funded business with um, you, you know some some initial capital that has been set aside and they've been earning interest on it or dividends uh, on on that income. Well, as they spend down, uh, their revenue would go down. So we actually saw a number of instances of exactly this scenario where someone was pre-revenue but qualified because their their uh, investment income was actually down from the prior year. So just one more way to to uh, to get someone uh, in there that that might otherwise not have qualified. And then of course for a nonprofit. Uh, similar but not identical uh, because we've got to factor in contributions, grifts, gifts, not grifts, gifts, grants, and member dues. Um, all right, so so we've talked about how to qualify the company, right? Um, now we need to talk about whether or not you know we we meet it from an employee threshold standpoint. Um, so for 2020, uh, we look at Section 206. And employers with uh, full-time employees of 100 or less in 2019 can qualify for the credit. Uh, any employees that receive qualified uh, wages during the specified period of 2020. So let's say we meet it uh, on the, the revenue uh, threshold. So we're down more than 50% in 2020, or we had a shutdown. Um, next, we have to look at those employees. Are we more than 100 full-time employees in 2019? And you know, there's an important difference here. If you've been working on PPP, PPP, as you know, looks at full-time equivalents. ERTC does not. Um, I'm not sure why they decided to uh, have two different measurement thresholds, but uh, actually I think it works to uh, the employer's benefit in this case because uh, they, they're looking at only full-time employees, and I'm gonna give you that definition in, in just a minute. Um, Employers with full-time employees greater than 100 in 2019 can only qualify for the credit for employees during the specified periods of 2020 that receive wages for sick pay, family medical leave due to a qualified uh, COVID-19 related circumstance. Uh, and it would also include uh, wages paid uh, or benefits uh, related to furloughed employees. So, uh, you know, if you're more than 100 and it's in 2020, more than 100 employees in 2019 and we're trying to get credit in 2020 it's really only going to be the cost that we incurred for people to stay home we paid them to stay home or uh and i've got some examples that actually are are kind of cool uh that that explain that a little better but um just want to cover this real quick uh section 207 uh changed the rules for 2021 uh and we're actually allowed to have 500 employees or more uh, i'm sorry 500 employees or less Again, looking back to 2019. So in, when we're determining credits for 2021, um, it's not just employees of 100 or less, it's 500 or less. And so if we meet the criterion for 2021 and we had 500 employees or less in 2019, then all of the employees that we have that uh, receive wages that are not uh, utilized for PPP forgiveness can qualify for the ERTC. So uh, if we, we had full-time employees greater than 500 in 2019, then it doesn't apply to all employees again. It would only apply to those employees who are basically paid to stay home. And that would also include uh, the uh, healthcare benefits. Okay, so how do we determine what, what's, what's a full-time employee? So a full-time employee with at least 30 hours of service per week or 130 hours uh, of service per month on average. So, uh, you know, we actually have to count our employees by month and the number of employees that we have each month that's over 30 hours per week or over 130 hours per month um, would, would then be added up for each of the 12 months and we would divide by 12 and that would be our full-time employees. So, um, uh, if we have less than uh, 12 months of operations in 2019, uh, then we would just look at the number of months of business that we were in operation in 2019, and that would be our denominator for the uh, the calculation. Um, so if you had 10 employees a month, uh, or let's make it easy, if you had 12 employees uh, a month, um, you'd, you'd add them all up, 144, divide by 12, you'd get 12. Um, so 
if, if you started your business in 2020, um, you would just substitute 2020 for 2019 when doing the calculations. So um, definitely not a, a difficult calculation, but something that needs to be uh, factored in if, if we believe that we have more than 100 employees or more than 500 employees back going back to 2019. So uh, what are the qualified wages and, and what's the credit? So uh, it's all wages uh, paid to employees within the determined period, plus all qualified healthcare costs. So employer healthcare costs, not the employee costs, but the employer healthcare costs. Wages are limited to $10,000 per qualified employee per year for 2020 only, okay? And that's for the period March 13th to uh, 2020 and ending December 31, 2020. And the credit amount in 2020 obviously is 50%. So it's a max credit per employee of $5,000. 2021, wages are limited to 10,000 per qualified employee per quarter. So really big difference there. Uh, and, and that's for all of 2021. So starting January 1, all the way to December 31. And uh, the credit is 70%, not 50%. So much more valuable in 2021. Um, for both, note that wages used to qualify for forgiveness related to a first draw PPP loan or a second draw PPP loan do not qualify for the ERTC. So there's no double dipping, but uh, you know the, the PPP forgiveness period, whether it was eight weeks or 24 weeks is not the whole year. So what we've been doing uh, is you know looking all around both before and after and in some cases, uh, you know, if, if somebody's maxed out uh, on their calculation for the PPP before that 24 weeks, then we're, we're, we're picking up uh, substantially more credits for ERTC uh, during that, that time frame. Uh, so we've got a, a, an example here. We've got a manufacturing company with 10 employees, has revenues in Q1 uh, uh, 2021 of 70% uh, of the total revenues when compared to Q1 of 2019. So they qualify. Uh, none of these wages were used to uh, offset PPP forgiveness. So you see in column one uh, of, of the wages, $25,000 and for employee one on down to employee 10 of $1,800, how each one is limited at $10,000 in wages, 70% um, times that amount, gives you $7,000 and so on down. So 10 employees in this example generates about $55,000 in credit. So let's let's look at this same example, but we're gonna go back uh, to 2020. And uh, it's, it's LA County based manufacturer uh, uh, <clears throat> that was shut down during 2020 Q2. It was also down more than 50%. So we qualify really on, under either case. Um, and uh, revenue for Q3 and Q4 was less than 80% of the revenue of each quarter when compared to 2019. So, uh, you know, one, one uh, point is if once you exceed 80% of your prior year's revenue or, or your 2019 revenue by quarter, then the subsequent quarter you can no longer take the ERTC. It doesn't blow you out of the water for the quarter that it happens because you wouldn't have any way of knowing that until the end of the quarter. So they actually allow you to take it until that moment in time. Um, anyway, back to our example here. The company also received $225,000 of, of a PPP loan in Q2 and used the 24-week period for forgiveness. So same basic payroll numbers. I just added a column in there for wages claim for PPP forgiveness. You can see that the remaining wages that are unclaimed for PPP are now eligible for ERTC, still capped at $10,000. Uh, times 50%, remember this is back in 2020, the credit is capped at 5,000, so it's a $35,000 credit still. Still uh, a pretty substantial credit. Um, so a couple of examples for large employers, because I think that this is really important. Uh, I think it could, it, it's something that could be easily overlooked. So uh, during March and April of 2020, an employer with greater than 100 full-time employees is subject to a governmental order uh, partially suspends operations of its trader business. So they're over that 100 uh, threshold uh, from 2019. We're thinking, well, maybe then they don't get it on every employee. 
but they get it on wages that they paid employees not to work, right? So they cut their, their uh, employees' hours by 50% but they only cut their wages by 40% and they continued to pay 100% of their healthcare costs. So in this case, the employer can treat 10% of the wages paid as qualifying wages uh, for the time the employees are not providing services, plus 50% of the employer's costs providing health insurance because these health plan expenses are uh, allocable to the time that the employees were not providing services, right? You know, part of it, they were they were getting paid to, to work. So that portion is getting allocated, but the other portion, uh, they were getting basically, uh, they, their benefits paid for them to stay home. So they actually uh, get to take the credit on that. What about for furloughed employees? Well, we've got a large employer, again, somebody with more than 100 in 2020, uh, or really 100 in 2019 for 2020. Um, you know, it's crazy when we start looking at 2019, 2020, and 2021, uh, we got a lot of stuff going on. But anyway, uh, employer is large, eligible employer, subject to a governmental order that fully suspends the operations of a trader business. The employer lays off or furloughs its employees, but doesn't treat these employees as terminated for employment tax purposes and does not pay wages to the employees, but does continue to cover 100% of the health care plan expenses. Well, just like our prior example, the employer may treat those as qualified wages uh, and, and calculate the credit on those, those costs. Let's talk about affiliation rules uh, for a little bit because this is actually another really important uh, fact pattern that can help uh, uh, bring in substantially more employees into, uh, into getting and qualifying for the ERTC. It can also knock uh, uh, folks out as well, but um, anyway, let's talk about these aggregation rules. Each employer has to, to consider aggregation if they if they actually uh, have multiple uh, companies and um, IRC section 414 M and O as well as IRC section 52 A or B um, uh, are are considered when when looking at these aggregation rules so um, if you're if you're thinking about an affiliated service group uh, uh, treated as a common employer so basically you know a simple uh, way to think of that is if you've got an employer that has the same healthcare plan for multiple corporations or multiple entities, um, it would meet that that uh, particular criterion. Um, under 52 uh, A and B, we're looking at five or fewer uh, individuals that own 80% or more of of each business, and uh, where each uh, business is. 50% uh, identical. Uh, so uh, it would also uh, be, um, that, that would be the brother-sister uh, group or a parent-subsidiary group uh, where we own more than 50% would, would apply. So um, these are, you know, the different considerations that have to be looked at. And once we look at those, then we need to uh, measure those together. If, if we actually determine that okay, we have to aggregate these five companies. Now we can't look at them company by company. We have to look at all five companies together for both the revenue as well as for the number of employees. So, so that's, that's something to think about. But another uh, benefit is we may have one company that was subject to a government shutdown and four companies that were not. And as long as that one company was greater than a nominal amount of our revenue or a nominal amount of our hours, and we aren't kicked out by one of the other qualifiers, then we can actually take the credit on all the employees for all five companies. So let's go to an example here. We've got a taxpayer that owns 80% of two restaurant partnerships and 100% of an affiliated management company. One of the restaurants is a full service restaurant and has been shut down for dine and meals due to a government order. Uh, we've all seen this. Uh, the other restaurant was takeout only and has been unaffected by the shutdown. So how do we determine whether or not the companies qualify, which sales are considered? So I've got an example here in the upper left quadrant. You can see we've got our dine-in sales for 2019 compared to 2020 by quarter. Uh, you know, Q1, we were only shut down for part of the quarter. So we, you know, had 77% uh, of the, the sales, but man, in Q2, 32%. 55% in Q3 and 24% in Q4. So, so we're, we're down more than 50% in Q1. Um, 
but uh, I am never more than 80% in, in, in Q2 and Q3. Um, but we have to actually aggregate this, right? Because we own 80%. Um, and, and, and I'll kind of go through on the next slide, I'm already answering my, my questions here, but we look at, at takeout in the lower left and we can see that that actually went up in revenue. And then we've got our management company that was a little down. On an aggregated basis, uh, we were down uh, 22%, uh, 43%, 21%, and 49%. So on an aggregated basis, never down more than 50%. But, um, you know, uh, as, as I already alluded to, we, we do have to aggregate these because we're, we're greater than 80%. Um, and uh, we were never down more than 50%, but we were shut down. And, and because our uh, sit-down restaurant was shut down, our to-go restaurant and our management company also get to benefit from that because as a group, we were shut down and we never, we didn't have more than 100 employees in 2020 or in 2019 for 2020. So, um, so that's a, a great example of how we group in and get ERTC on even an enterprise that was actually up in revenue uh, because we had a related party, um, an aggregated party that was actually uh, shut down or partially shut down. Um, Here's the same example, but the taxpayer only owns 50% of the two restaurant partnerships and 100% of the uh, management company. Um, uh, the restaurant, uh, the takeout restaurant, of course, was unaffected. The, the, shut, the shutdown did affect the uh, sit down. So how do we determine uh, if any of the companies qualify? So same example, same numbers in this example, we're, we're claiming that they, they shouldn't be aggregated. Now, there could be uh, under 414 an argument to say that, that they do need to be aggregated because of common control. Um, I didn't go that route here because I just wanted to show this example of, of having to look at each of them separately. Um, so uh, here, uh, the dine-in operation meets the 50% reduced sales threshold in Q2 and then would subsequently qualify for Q3 and Q4. Uh, and uh, obviously, uh, if they hadn't met it, the revenue threshold, they would have met it because of the shutdown. And then the other two companies wouldn't qualify because they weren't impacted uh, by the 50% threshold or the government order uh, shutdown. So uh, in this case, it would only be the sit-down restaurant that, that qualified for the ERTC. Uh, and, and again, Remember that uh, if we get PPP funding, we can't use the same wages. How do we claim this credit? Well, if the employer's uh, employment tax deposits are not sufficient to cover the credit, and if someone does have payroll taxes sufficient to cover the credit, I don't know how that would be. I, I don't know mathematically how that can happen. But um, in, in the case that uh, someone doesn't, uh, which again, I haven't seen an example where they do, uh, they can request an advance credit by filing the form 7200. Um, that that form was released for 2021, just a, about a month ago, um, and and actually the uh, the Q1941 was just released uh, in the last day or two as well. So uh, the other way to 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 claim the credit is to to reduce payroll tax deposits uh, that they're otherwise required to make. But that's only going to get you part of the way there. That's that's not the whole the whole thing. So uh, certainly. Uh, at the end of the quarter, uh, there, there's got to be a reconciliation process if you do file the 7200. Uh, and, and that's what we're recommending that people do. File the 7200, uh, fax in the form to the IRS number. Um, the IRS, under-resourced, uh, as you well know, is not, I have yet to see where they're issuing checks. It's supposed to be a check sent to the taxpayer. Um, uh, I've got a little example here. I don't, I don't know that it really matters, but, uh, you know, somebody has a, a, a single credit, $7,000, they had $8,000 of, of payroll tax. They would reduce the, the payroll tax by $7,000 and, and then pay that thousand. It's, it's really the other way that we're going to see it, uh, basically hundred percent of the time, I think, um, where someone's going to file the request in advance. Uh, so think about it, right now, people who have been paying payroll to their employees 
can calculate the credit, assuming they qualify, file a form 7200, request the advance check, uh, and then in April, when they file their 941 form, they would just report that uh, they had taken advances on their on their 7200, and um, it would reduce the amount of credit that would otherwise be refunded. So um, I, I think that I hope that the IRS is is ramping up. I think part of the impact has been that the uh, stimulus checks that the IRS has to issue uh, has has slowed them down from being able to respond to these requests. But I'm I'm very hopeful for the taxpayers that are desperately needing this benefit and and expecting these funds that the IRS will be able to start issuing those checks relatively soon. Um, so you're not supposed to fill out the form if you are also reducing your payroll tax deposits. Um, I think an argument could be made to reduce your payroll tax deposits uh, as well as uh, adjusting that amount on the form because I don't know how long, and most people are opting to pay the payroll taxes and file the form. Um, I just don't know how long it's going to take the IRS to, to get off the dime. So that that's something that um, is a little up in the air. I'm hoping to get some clarification on that this week. Um, so no banking information is required to be on the form. They actually are issuing a check and the IRS will issue a 6313 letter if they have a question about the address. Obviously they're trying to prevent fraud. So if there's a different mailing address on the 7200 form than what's been reported on the 941s, that's gonna uh, draw uh, you know, additional inquiry from the IRS. And that, that could be the case uh, if you've got somebody who maybe they use a PEO and the PEO has their address on the 941 and the taxpayer is using the form 7200 and using their address. So um, for 2021 credit, Q4 of 2020 may be compared to Q4 of 2019 to satisfy the gross receipts test for Q1 of, that should be, that's a typo, that should say Q1 of 2021. Um, so, uh, Anyone that is uh, sitting here right now, we're in Q1 of 2021, um, and uh, they they were down 20% in Q4, or just a little over 20% in Q4 of 2020 when compared to 2019. Now, that's a lot of people when you think about it, because COVID's had an impact on on business. Um, uh, certainly, all of those people that are in that boat would qualify for the credit a 70% credit on up to $10,000 weight in wages per employee, uh, provided that they had 500 or less full-time employees in 2019 for Q1. That's a big population. So just uh, keep keep that in mind. Um, some final tax considerations. Uh, don't forget that you have to reduce uh, your tax deductions by the amount of the credit. Like any other credit, uh, you have to reduce the amount of your deductions on your 2020 tax return, regardless of when you receive the refund. So that means that we're going to have a lot of extensions for businesses that are taking ERTC because you don't want to have to go back and amend the return. I don't see the, the, the reason for doing that. Um, so uh, uh, please uh, factor that in. Uh, credits may be retroactively claimed on an amended payroll tax return. Um, any amended payroll tax returns filed for the year 2020 must be received by the IRS by April 15th, 2024. That's right. Um, you actually have, uh, and and actually, uh, I, I wonder, Ian, that might be something that we've got to run down. With the change in the statute, that may extend that um, through another two years. We'll have to uh, address that um, because I think uh, that's something that, that might have uh, changed uh, last week. Um, PP for, uh, PPP forgiveness is completely tax-free. The coordination of the ERTC and PPP is important in order to optimize the benefits of both. And, and that's something that obviously you want to make sure that you get your full PPP forgiveness and as much of the ERTC on top of that, not the other way around. Um, uh, also, just one other thing, uh, there is also for 2021 interplay of other credits. So if you're getting WOTC, Empowerment Zone, um, R&D credits that you're taking on the payroll tax return, um, those are, are 
uh, affect the amount of the ERTC credits that can be taken. So there's there's a lot of interaction between other laws here that you have to factor in uh, in order to do this right. So just making sure that that you, you're looking at it carefully as you're as you're you're going through this. Obviously, this is a service that we're providing. Um, we're here to to help. Um, we can be a resource for you. Um, so we'll, we'll help determine whether or not somebody qualifies, whether the wages, what other credits that are impacted, um, assist with the 7200, et cetera. Um, you know, everything from soup to nuts, uh, we can be a resource for you.